Those are really based on the assumptions about how the physical world works. If you just apply those rules to the digital environment, uh, you end up with some really odd, curious results. Uh, in, in some places, the rules mean the government has no power to do what you kind of think, well, they should be able to do that. Or you think, wow, well, the government is given an extraordinary power that they shouldn't have. And the, the reason why we get this change in the government's power is because technology has changed the effect of rules that made a lot of sense in the physical environment. Uh, and this is a, a topic that matters more and more as more uh, uh, criminal investigations involve digital evidence collection. This is something that happened gradually over the last, say, 30 or 40 years. Uh, used to be you'd have kind of computer crime cases. Uh, cases that involve digital evidence would be maybe a computer hacking case in the 1980s. They kind of well, war games, Matthew Broderick movies, uh, uh, digital evidence being created. And what happened over time, of course, is that people started to carry computers with them. Uh, uh, I have one right here, probably pretty similar uh, to the one that you have uh, with you. Uh, almost every adult, uh, or most great majority of adults in this state have cell phones. Uh, and uh, those cell phones are no longer just you know phones, they're really computers that happen to have telephone abilities. Uh, but that's why we call them phones. But they're really network machines, and they store an extraordinary amount of information. Uh, so everyone's carrying around a computer uh, and using computers all day long. So probably you wake up in the morning uh, and you check your email. Uh, or you wake up in the morning and you check the news. Well, you're not probably looking at a newspaper. You're probably looking online. Uh, and that means that you have a computer with you, which is uh, uh, kind of like this, but stores even more stuff and is even faster, uh, and is communicating with computers all around the world that are keeping records of your activity, that are maybe keeping, storing your emails. Uh, for example, I have a Gmail account. Well, that means when I'm checking my email, I'm actually sending a signal to uh, Google in California, Google, and saying, hey, Google, send me the emails that people uh, have, have sent into my account. Uh, and Google is then sending a request to its computers to gather that material and send it to me. Well, where is it coming from? It could be coming from anywhere in the world. Uh, it's not like there's a single computer in uh, California, which is Google servers. Google has servers all, all around the world. And when you request uh, your email, it could be part of your email is coming from California. Part of your email is coming from a server in Florida. Part of your email is coming from a server in Canada. And it's all being instantaneously assembled and sent to you. What does this mean for criminal investigations? Well, it means that the government, in gathering evidence of crime, is no longer just looking at the scene of the crime for physical evidence. Uh, they're looking for digital evidence. They want to search people's phones. They want to search people's computers. They want to search people's email accounts. Uh, in gathering evidence of crime, they want to go where the evidence is going to be. And that means that there's more and more digital evidence of crime, in some ways tracking traditional forms of evidence, or maybe an email is kind of the modern version of a letter, uh, or in some ways being new kinds of evidence. So one uh, type of evidence that we started to see a lot of in a lot of cases uh, that did not generally exist before is cell site. So whenever you're using your phone in order to communicate with the network, your phone is constantly sending signals to the telephone provider saying, hey, I'm over here. And the, the phone says, oh, the, the, the network says, all right, well, we're going to connect you to a cell tower uh, nearby to route your calls. And sometimes you, know, you can turn on your phone and it says searching. What that means is I'm looking for a local cell tower to connect to the network. Uh, and the fact that you're constantly connecting to the network means that the phone company has records that roughly track your location. It's not exact. It's not going to say you're in this room, for example. But it'll say that you're on this campus. Uh, some information that gives location. And that information can be terrifically useful for the government if they're trying to show somebody who was in a particular place uh, and, and when they, for example, when a crime occurred, uh, it turns out your, your phone um, is, is generating these records whenever you're placing a call uh, or whenever you're sending a text message or receiving a text message or receiving a call. There are records as to which cell tower your phone is connected to, and that's become tremendously uh, powerful evidence that the government is uh, using in cases to prove a burglary. They might want to show that the phone where the burglary occurred or uh, to show that somebody went from one part of the, the, the state to another part of the state, 
they can put up the map showing here's the location of the cell phone. And, and these records are kept historically, so the government can get it for a past crime and try to show the location. This is just a few examples of how we've entered a world of uh, increased digital evidence. And the, the question becomes, well, what are the rules the government has to follow to collect that information? The old rules of the Fourth Amendment don't provide a lot of guidance. Uh, they provide some guidance, but not a lot. Uh, they're pretty vague tests, like some of you who uh, study Fourth Amendment law may be familiar with, the reasonable expectation of privacy test. Um, on its face, that phrase, reasonable expectation of privacy, the idea being the government conduct is a search, when it implicates a reasonable expectation of privacy, that doesn't tell you anything. Um, reasonable how, expectation of what kind, and what is privacy? The, the words don't really answer directly what the test is. It's sort of a constitutional term of art. Uh, and um, courts trying to figure out, well, what is protected by a reasonable expectation of privacy? Or, or what makes a search reasonable? Um, are struggling to deal with the difference between the mechanisms of evidence collection in the physical world and the mechanisms of evidence collection in the digital world. And why are they different? Well, um, they're different in a couple of, of, of different ways. Uh, one is just pure physicality. You're a, think of how the Supreme Court has created Fourth Amendment rules in the physical world. You can, uh, uh, the, the rules say, okay, police, you can walk in open fields. You can walk down a public street, you can walk on a field, you can walk, uh, say, in the area up to a person's home, and that is not a search, that is not a trespass into a protected area, it doesn't buy, uh, implicate a reasonable expectation of privacy. You can do that. On the other hand, um, if you come up close to a house, or if you break into someone's uh, mail, or you open up their car trunk, that is a search. That's the rules that the Supreme Court has, has said. Uh, and those create pretty clear lines for the police to follow. You, know, you can't go in circumstances when you walk up to the home, uh, you can walk on a street. If you're a police officer, you can get that. It's a very physical concept of you, the, you, you get a Fourth Amendment search when the government is breaking into a private space. It's, it's very spatial. Well, how does that apply online? How do you apply a spatial concept to what is really a communications network that is global, that applies all around, that, that is a, a, a global network where the information is coming from all over, and the, the picture that a user sees is kind of created by the operating system for the user? How do you apply those same concepts? Um, really difficult questions of essentially translating concepts from a physical world to the digital world uh, in ways that have to allow for the possibility of new rules given the new dynamics, new facts of the digital environment. And uh, interestingly, the Supreme Court's first case uh, dealing with uh, computer search and seizure followed this methodology. Uh, they, they recognized that you can't just mechanically apply the old rules you have to think about what are the factual differences between the new environment and the old environment, and what new rules essentially recreate the kind of function of the old rules in the new environment. And, and the case that did this is a, is a, a Supreme Court case called Riley versus California. <coughs> uh, the issue in Riley versus California is a, a Fourth Amendment doctrine called the search incident to arrest exception. This goes back to the English common law, goes back hundreds of years, the basic idea being that when somebody is arrested, the government uh, can search the person, search what's on the person, without a warrant or without additional cause. When you're arrested, you're being brought into custody, the government needs to search the person, and what the Supreme Court said in the 1973 case called the United States versus Robinson, is there's just a bright line rule. Whenever the person is arrested, everything on that person can be searched. So in the physical world, that means uh, the government can uh, uh, open up what's in the person's pockets. In the Robinson case, the guy stopped for driving without a valid license. Officer sees a crumpled cigarette package, opens up the cigarette package and finds heroin. What had been a driving without a license case turns into a drug case. The Supreme Court says, we're not gonna have case-by-case -case inquiries into whether any particular search is reasonable. It's important to have searches incident to arrest uh, because the officer needs to protect the evidence of the crime. Uh, and the officer also needs to protect his own safety, and we do that with a simple rule that says searches of the person are reasonable. 
So that's the rule in 1973. And you can say, well, maybe it should be a bright line rule. Maybe it should be case by case. You can quibble at, at, at the court's rule. But to my mind, it reflects kind of a reasonable effort to balance law enforcement needs and privacy needs in the specific context of somebody being arrested. OK, that's 1973 technology, where what's the evidence a person is going to have in their pocket? In their pocket, well, maybe it's drugs, in the case of Robinson. Or Maybe they've got a note uh, 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 about the crime or something, but they're not going to store a lot of evidence in their pockets. Not the case by 2014. Uh, you have the introduction of the iPhone, um, and I guess 20, uh, 2007, 2008 around, uh, and then uh, the introduction of the smartphone leads to very rapid uh, 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 spread of the use of smartphones until it becomes the norm by 2014. Uh, and uh, think about how the technological shift of everyone carrying around a smartphone changes the effect of the Robinson rule. So the Robinson rule is a bright line rule. Everybody can get searched fully when they're arrested, period. Well, suddenly people are carrying cell phones. And if you're a police officer, what do you want to do when you arrest somebody uh, for, for a crime? Well, you'd love to search their cell phone. You never know what you might find. You might find evidence of the crime. You might find evidence of other crimes. There's so much information on a cell phone, uh, the equivalent of uh, uh, millions of pages worth of data. I mean, people's essentially their digital lives located on their phone. And for a while, the uh, lower court said, well, we've got the Supreme Court rule in Robinson, and we're just lower courts. So we just apply the doctrine. And that means that, yes, the police can search someone's cell phone incident to arrest. And year by year, uh, cell phones changed and had more and more evidence. I, you know the, the phrase that Apple introduced, there's an app for that. Uh, and that means there's evidence of conduct relating to the app for that uh, that's on the phone. And there may be a record as to where the person was over time. There may be all their text messages, photographs, striking how many people who commit a crime think it would be really cool to take a photograph of me with the, the gold I just stole uh, or, or whatever it is. And kind of neat, look at what I got. Well, that's really great evidence if you're a police officer. So the police want to search the phones incident to arrest. And the question that gets to the Supreme Court in Riley is, what do you do with the Robinson rule? And the Supreme Court, I think, quite wisely says, uh, computers are different. This is a totally new ballgame. There's so much stuff on these devices. You can't compare it to, uh, uh, to, to searching someone's pocket for uh, a crumpled, crumpled cigarette package for heroin. It's just a totally different ballgame. Uh, and the, the government said, well, it's the same basic idea. You're searching their pockets for evidence. And uh, uh, an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, the court says, that's like saying a, a horse and buggy is like a trip to the moon. Uh, they're both ways of getting from one place to another. Uh, but other than that, they have nothing in common. Uh, and so the court introduced a bright line rule for computer searches, which is that incident to arrest searches for cell phones or any digital storage device on the person requires a search warrant. Uh, so you have essentially the rule the police have to follow now is if they arrest somebody, they can search physical stuff, but digital stuff ordinarily will need a warrant. Uh, and I think that's the right methodology. It's, it's treating the digital as different because the facts of digital evidence and investigations are so different. Um, I want to talk about another example of this uh, same uh, dynamic. This is maybe the, the, a future Riley case. This is the next round of this kind of thinking, uh, which is okay, if the government is going to allow, uh, is going to have to get search warrants to search computers, what do the search warrants allow the government to do? Uh, so let me talk a little bit about search warrants in sort of the traditional physical environment and then talk about the different dynamics of searches for computers and, and digital evidence. So in the physical world, the warrant clause, which I read to you at the very beginning uh, of this talk, uh, says that uh, the government needs to particularly describe the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. The notion being that when the government executes a search warrant, they're going to go trespass into a place, typically, classically, uh, the suspect's home. Uh, and they're going to break into the house. And they're going to look around for evidence. And the Fourth Amendment is designed to limit how the government does that. And it limits how the government does that in a couple of different ways. One is by requiring the government to say in the warrant application, exactly what place are you going to search? What's the place to be searched? What's typically the home? 
So it might be you know, 123 Main Street Apartment 2 uh, is the place to be searched. And the government can only search that place under the warrant. That's the first requirement. Second requirement is that the government has to say, what's the evidence they're going to seize? The idea being that they're going to go into the house or the apartment and look for the evidence seized. Sometimes that evidence seized can be described very specifically. So for example, if it's a stolen artwork, a stolen painting or something, the description of the thing to be seized might be that specific painting. And the idea is the government can only search for that painting. Uh, it's not a subjective test, but the court looks at whether the search was consistent with a search for that painting. The government is not allowed to search in a place where the painting might not be located. So for example, if they see a book uh, and they want to sort of, you know, officers leaf through the pages uh, trying to find drugs hidden in the pages, the court will say, no, 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 the painting, which was this big by this big, cannot possibly be in the book, and that exceeds the scope of the allowed uh, search. And then once the government finds what they're looking for, was described in the warrant, they have to stop. So after the government is found, they find the painting, they can't go, okay, that was cool, let's keep searching. They already found what was described in the warrant. And the thought is that these limitations, physical-based limitations on the place to be searched, the persons or things to be seized, limit the scope of the search to avoid what in the English common law was called general warrants. These were warrants uh, which were authorized uh, and then later condemned in the uh, mid to late 18th century uh, that basically allowed the king's officials to go anywhere uh, uh, and look for evidence of any crime and take it. Or even things that weren't evidence of a crime. And the, the famous case, uh, Entech versus Carrington, uh, involved a search warrant that allowed for a search of uh, any place that uh, where John Entech kept his books, and then told the government, you know, you can seize any of his books. Didn't limit it to seizing evidence of any crime. Uh, he was suspected of libeling the king, critic of the king. Um, uh, but the idea was that the uh, the ban on general warrants said, okay, you have to have a specific warrant that says where the government's going to go and what are they going to seize. Now, what's Important is that if you're a good faith police officer trying to follow these rules in the digital environment, the facts of computers are so different in the execution of warrants that you struggle to figure out why isn't the execution of a computer warrant effectively like a general warrant? Uh, let me talk a little bit about why. So as a practical matter, you're a police officer, let's say you're, you're um, conducting a search for fraud records, and the fraud records are believed likely to be stored in electronic form. And let's stick with the address I mentioned earlier, 123 Main Street, Apartment 2. You go into 123 Main Street, Apartment 2, and what do you find? Let's say uh, two desktop computers, some external hard drives, some thumb drives, and 20 CD ROMs. And uh, the thing you're going to seize are tax records from 2013, belonging to a particular suspect. Uh, or maybe not or something, maybe just tax records from 2013. Okay, so collect the tax records and go. How are you going to do that? Well, you've got a problem. The records are, if they exist, you don't know, are in electronic form, and they could be on any of those storage devices, or all those storage devices, copies, or different parts, in different places. But you don't know where they're located, and you don't have an easy way of finding those records. Uh, they could be stored anywhere on any of those devices, and the amount of storage on any device could be massive. Um, so just, just to, to add a couple of numbers to this, I was looking online at uh, a, a gigabyte uh, on a typical storage device is about 65,000 pages of the equivalent of a Microsoft Word document, word processing. <coughs> so imagine you're a, a police officer and you uh, come across a flash drive. Well, how many gigabytes are on a typical flash drive? Uh, anywhere, usually maybe eight to 256 gigabytes, depending. You know, your, you know, earlier ones had less, and newer ones may have more. Uh, but what that means is there's like say a million pages potentially worth of documents on a single thumb drive. Uh, or imagine an external hard drive. Say you go for a hundred bucks or so, you buy a five terabyte uh, hard, uh, external hard drive. That's the equivalent of hundred million pages of word processing documents. And you, the police officer, go into the apartment and there's not just one of these external hard drives, there's a bunch. And a bunch of hard drives 
and you don't know where the evidence is. Like, what, do you, what do you do? You have no magic tool to recover the information. Uh, what courts have said is that it's reasonable, in the, because there's sort of no alternative, to seize the different storage devices and, and bring them to law enforcement custody, to search those uh, in, in, in law enforcement custody. Effectively, the only way to practically carry out the warrant is to just grab everything and look at it back in the lab. Well, how is it going to be searched back in the lab? In order to figure out where the evidence is located on the computer storage device, the only way to make sure is to go through everything on the electronic storage device. Uh, maybe you'll, the government will get lucky and they'll find what they're looking for quickly. Uh, but a lot of times they won't. It'll take them a while. It might take days, uh, the equivalent of searching through, or even weeks or longer, to try to find the set of documents, uh, which sometimes will be a keyword that makes it easy to find, but that can easily be changed. Um, so that it's not a, a available through that simple search technique. You can sort of imagine um, searching a really big filing cabinet for a document. You might open up the filing cabinet and immediately look for, you know, if you're looking for 2012 taxes. Oh, look, you find a folder that says 2012 taxes. But if you open it and it's an empty folder, it's not like you're, you're a police officer and you're going to say, well, I believe now there are no such documents. You're going to look through the rest of the filing cabinet because it might have been displaced, it might have been intentionally Place. Uh, and when you consider the size of electronic storage devices, that means there's a very invasive search uh, that, that technologically has to occur in order to execute the warrant. Why does that matter? Well, it matters in part because of a doctrine called plain view. This is another physical world doctrine that says when the government is conducting a search or seizure, uh, if they come across evidence of any other crime, uh, and there's probable cause to believe that the evidence they come across is, is evidence of the crime, uh, any crime, they can seize that information and, and use it, even though it's not described in the warrant. So think of how that rule applies in the digital environment. The government technologically has to search everything. They have to take everything. They have to uh, seize everything. They have to search everything. And if they come across any other information, which is evidence of some other crime, at least where there's it's sort of on its face clear that it's evidence of a crime, they can take that. Well, if you're a police officer, that creates some really, really interesting incentives. Um, in particular, what is your incentive to follow the warrant? Um, you could say, well, this is great. We can have pretext searches. Give me probable cause to search the person's house. I'll grab all their computers. I'll look through everything there. Maybe I'll just find embarrassing things. Maybe I'll find evidence of some crimes, and we can then prosecute them for those crimes. Uh, if you think about that, that sounds a lot like general warrants. Uh, which were the reason the Fourth Amendment was enacted to ban general warrants. So the traditional particularity requirements were these physical concepts of here's the place that can be searched, here's the physical item that can be seized. Uh, and the plain view doctrine was based on an assumption of the physical world that, um, yeah, if you're searching a place and you come across drugs, you're searching a tax, for tax fraud doctrine, and you come across drugs, you shouldn't have to just blind yourself to the drugs there if you drugs in plain view, makes sense to take them. The alternative would be to say, hey, you have to go back and get another warrant. By the time you get the other warrant, the person's going to probably throw away their drug. So go ahead and take it. That makes sense in the physical world. In the digital world, those same rules create effectively the factual scenario that the Fourth Amendment was enacted to stop, uh, which is general warrants, seize everything, search for everything, use everything. Technology has changed to basically uh, uh, alter the effect of the old rules. And to my mind, that calls for a new set of rules governing search warrants uh, along the lines of Riley, just like the court, the Supreme Court of Riley said, we can't just apply the old Robinson rule. Computers are just different and source no more information. We need to look at the effect of the rule in the new factual environment. And I think that calls for another, uh, a kind of another Riley moment of a new set of rules governing the execution of search warrants. Uh, and so what I would suggest um, is something along these lines. Um, generally speaking, the government should be allowed to seize all the computers on site because there's no obvious technological alternative to that. They have obtained a search warrant based on probable cause. I believe there's evidence of the crime in the place to be searched, and they should be allowed to take the steps necessary to obtain that evidence. So I think that initial stage, when I think of the physical stage of the search, they go into the place, they grab the computers, 
I think, unfortunately, there's sort of no other technological way uh, uh, to, to allow the search to be effectuated than to allow that. But, and here's the important caveat, um, I think the Supreme Court and lower courts should interpret the Fourth Amendment to impose a use restriction on non-responsive data. The idea would be the government is allowed to use that which is within the scope of the warrant. If they need to search every file on that hard drive, they can. But they can only use what is described in the warrant itself. If they come across evidence of crime that is not in the warrant, they can't use that. Uh, the way of thinking about this is no plain view exception for digital storage. Um, effectively having a rule kind of like Riley. Riley's rule is uh, 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 incident to arrest, can search the person, can search all the physical, can't search the digital without a warrant. Equivalently, I would say, when searching with a warrant, the government is allowed to use plain view evidence in the physical world. They're not allowed to use it in the digital environment. Why? Because so much more stuff comes into plain view. There's so much more data uh, uh, that to allow the government to use that same plain view exception effectively lets the exception swallow the rule. You end up with, instead of limited warrants with a little bit of an exception, you end up with kind of just a broad green light for the government to, to search the entirety of a person's digital world based on probable cause to believe there's evidence of one particular crime. Uh, and a way of thinking about this, there are a couple of doctrinal ways of, of, of getting there. I think one way of thinking about it is that instead of looking at the computer as one thing, the better way of thinking about it is all of the data on the device is being seized, and you need to think about what is a reasonable seizure of that data. So the seizure of the responsive information, that is the information described in the warrant, uh, it's reasonable for the government to permanently seize that. In fact, that's the whole point of a warrant, right? It allows the government to collect the information and to seize it. Uh, but what about the non-responsive information? This is all the stuff that is not the evidence of the crime. Basically, everything that's not described in the warrant. Well, the only, the only reason the government is allowed to seize that is because they have to seize that at that initial physical search stage in order to carry out the warrant. So what I would say is that the government is allowed to seize that, it is reasonable to seize that, uh, because they need to do that to carry out the warrant, but that it's not reasonable for the government to then use that non-responsive information for other purposes when the warrant was not for that information. Uh, it's one of a couple of different ways you can sort of reach the same result, that it's reasonable to stick with the information described in the warrant, but the government can't take advantage of the plain view exception uh, in, in the digital environment. But this would be, I have to concede, a dramatic new rule. And I've, I've discussed this approach uh, in lo to law enforcement audiences, and I can kind of get the glasses down there. Where are you getting this from? Why can't we use evidence? Basically, from a prosecutor's standpoint, we might discover evidence of a crime. We want to prosecute based on that. I say, right. So you're saying we can't prosecute. I say, right. Why would we not want to prosecute? I know you want to prosecute. It just turns out that if we allow you to prosecute, then this, the rule that is created, the incentives are created, effectively are, are, are cutting so much into the traditional historical function of the Fourth Amendment that we can't have that rule anymore. Uh, and I get probably back from the law enforcement crowd. Um, amazingly, in an academic environment, I get a lot of people nodding their heads and they think, of course that should be the rule. Uh, uh, so this is something that the courts are now grappling with. Um, the initial decisions uh, uh, said it's the same rule, so we have a plain view exception, it should apply in the same, con same way in the digital environment. Uh, a few courts then started to question that. Uh, one court of the 10th Circuit said there should be a subjective test for plain view instead of objective, a way of basically saying, if the officer intended to look beyond the warrant, they're not allowed to do that, which so cutting back a little bit. Uh, and the Massachusetts Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Judicial Court, and the Second Circuit, and a recent panel of the Third Circuit have each suggested that they might want to feel a need to cut back on the plain view exception along these lines as well. Sort of recognizing we're in this new digital environment. You just can't apply these old rules. Um, one interesting uh, a question raised by this proposal to end, end the plain view exception, uh, 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 to my mind, an interesting question is, um, what happens if the evidence the government discovers is evidence of some ongoing crime or something that raises uh, uh, an emergency. The, the, the worst example, or the, the toughest example, I think, is what if the government is searching 
or you know, there's evidence of tax fraud, and they come across evidence of a terrorist attack which is about to occur. And one hour later, it will be occurring. What are they supposed to do? Um, now, one answer is, okay, what are the odds that in searching my hard drive back in the lab, they're coming across the likelihood of a you know, terrorist attack in one hour? Um, but that's dodging the hypothetical, which, um, as, as law professors say, you can't do that. You've got you to gotta answer it. Uh, and I think the answer is for courts to uh, carve out an exigent circumstances exception to the ban on plain view. So the rule would be, in, in executing a warrant, uh, the government is not allowed to use non-responsive information, that is information outside the scope of the warrant, unless uh, the uh, observing of that evidence shows exigent circumstances justifying use effectively, justifying you know, if there's a uh, protecting public safety, uh, some emergency uh, that would justify that. So they'd be allowed to uh, uh, use the information in the case of a terrorist attack uh, if it was, you know, they're searching for evidence of a fraud crime and they come across evidence of a burglary two years ago, they couldn't use that. So it's a ban on, on information. And I think you, a good, there's a good argument to be made that the ban should not only extend to use in court, but disclosure. Uh, so, uh, in the grand jury context, there's a general rule that what the grand jury does is secret. They're allowed to collect a lot of information, but what the grand jury does is not to be revealed, except in certain circumstances. Uh, and I think you could, I think there's a good argument to be made that the ban on the use of non-responsive information should extend to disclosure. Being that if the government comes across embarrassing information, but not criminal information, they can't disclose that information because the disclosure of the data makes that continuing seizure unreasonable. The, the disclosure is not related to carrying out the warrant. It is purely for other purposes and should not be allowed. Uh, effectively saying, hey, government, you're allowed to get the information. You can conduct a very invasive search for the information, but you have to stick to what is described in the warrant. Restoring the historical function of the warrant requirement uh, uh, and, and continuing the ban on uh, general warrants in the digital environment, which is so factually different um, from the physical world, but nonetheless requires us to kind of figure out what are the set of rules that restore that constitutional role in the new digital environment. Okay, so that's an overview. I can give other examples. Uh, this is a, a forthcoming book, I should say, uh, called The Digital Fourth Amendment, uh, and I've written three chapters and have several to go. Um, so I could give you other chapters, but I think we're out of time in terms of my talk. I wanted to turn it over for your questions at this point. Hopefully you've got a few questions, or else I'm just going to talk about more chapters. So, um, yes? So um, what I think is interesting is that you kind of were talking a little bit about cell phones um, and Riley, which I think is kind of interesting how it all kind of ties back to cats in some ways. But um, I think... What was really interesting about Riley and the way that the court came down was because at that point, all of these crusty old men and women had a lot of personal data in their pocket. But that leads me to, um, what do you think about silent circle phones or like Boeing black phones or any of these other, you know, end to end encrypted phones? Yeah, so the, the, the very important question is how does the state of technology alter the need to change the constitutional rules? Um, so, so the Constitution itself is not going to regulate what the state of technology is, right? It's not like there's going to be a constitutional rule that says phones have to work a certain way. If technology evolves uh, such that there's less information available to the government, that's something for the political processes to work out, not something for the Constitution to mandate. Uh, an important question, though, is I think it's important to realize that the facts, in terms of how much information is available, um, is a two-way street in terms of thinking about how the new constitutional rules might work. So just as a, you know, the examples I've given of Riley and uh, search warrants are examples of the government having more information Right? So we go from the physical world in the 70s where searching somebody that's in arrest doesn't give the government much to the digital world where it gives them an incredible amount of information. 
So that, in, in both cases, in that in the search warrant context, it's the government gets more, how should the rules cut back? But that can work in both ways. Uh, you might have technology can actually mean that the government has less information than it used to have. Um, and this is you know, the, the going dark debate in terms of the use of encryption and making less information available to the government um, may lead to shifts in the rules the other way, uh, lessening constitutional protections uh, under the Fourth Amendment in response to the changing technological environment that makes less information available. Uh, and and, and one, one way in which I think this plays out uh, is there's an important issue as to whether the Fourth Amendment should protect metadata, it's a record about phone calls, records of child emails. Uh, and I think one implication of expanded use of encryption is going to be pressure for the Supreme Court to maintain the traditional rule that metadata is not protected. Why? Well, as we move towards more consistently strong encryption, that means that content wiretapping becomes incredibly difficult, if not impossible, other than certain circumstances. It becomes harder but, uh, uh, than it used to be. The government can get the court order, get the warrant, but not be able to effectuate that warrant. That means that the only information that they can get is, at least in some circumstances, going to be the metadata. Uh, and I think that will pressure the Supreme Court to make sure that the metadata is not protected. Whereas in a world where the government could access contents with a warrant, I think there's significant pressure to start having at least some constitutional protection for metadata. So, so it's an important example because it kind of brings up, it's, it's a two-way street here. It's not just technology expands government power, um, law is expanding to meet that challenge. It goes the other way too. They go in the opposite direction. What about something like cell site simulators, stingray devices? How do they fit into your analysis? Are they something that uh, should always require a warrant, sometimes require a warrant, never require a warrant? Yeah, it's a great question. So these are uh, uh, technologies which um, they're often called cell site simulators. They uh, basically trick your phone into giving up its location. Uh, so the government can be nearby, and um, they send a ping, which basically says, hey, I'm a cell tower. Why don't you connect to me? Of course, it's not actually a cell tower. It's a government agent with a device. And then your phone says, hey, I'm over here. And that lets the government figure out your location. Um, so there are a couple different ways uh, the courts can approach that. There, there's only been one appellate decision so far uh, on this question. Uh, but the, the, the traditional, the sort of way of fitting that into prior law would be to say that, that we've got cases from the 1980s involving location devices where those would be cases where the, the government inserts a homing beacon into you know, your luggage or into something that you have in your car and the government can then figure out your location based on the location of the beacon. Uh, and the, what the Supreme Court said in those cases was that the beacons in public uh, or in a thing which is in public, uh, like in a car, for example, then there's not a Fourth Amendment search. On the other hand, if it is um, uh, brought inside a house, for example, then it becomes a Fourth Amendment search to figure out where inside the, the Fourth Amendment protected space that item is. So one answer uh, for uh, uh, stingrays would just be to apply that rule. It would basically mean that the government can't figure out where somebody is inside a house, but they can figure out where somebody is in public. That's a possibility. Another possibility would just be a bright line rule that says, this is a very invasive technology. Um, the, uh, you know, thinking of, again, adjusting the rules for technological change. Yeah, you could have a, a beacon in the 1980s cases. That was possible, but very rare. Uh, on the other hand, stingrays are very, you could use them widely. They're dropping in price, and they basically turn cell phones into location devices. If everybody's carrying a cell phone, the implications of that 1980 set of cases is really different um, uh, today than it was in the 1980s, and you could justify an increased privacy protection rule kind of, again, along the Riley's line. So I think those are the two most likely possibilities. There's sort of the current doctrine, only inside is it a search, and then there's the it's always a search option. Um, the one case we've seen so far was from the Maryland Court of Special Appeals and State Intermediate Appellate Court. Uh, and they, they adopted it always a search rule, although the analysis wasn't, wasn't all that great. So we'll 
we'll see what the Maryland Supreme Court does with that. Thank you. The back. Is there any effective difference in the latitude afforded uh, a request for uh, a search of, say, business records in a criminal enterprise, something on the order of uh, Enron, WorldCom, Bernie Madoff, where in a civil context, and most judges practicing in the federal courts will have more, will have a civil than criminal law background, and they're used to, to propounding or receiving requests for all records in any form, digital, on tape, on paper, on three by five cards, in a condominium that has been rented with a slush fund that is not at the corporate headquarters, that is not in the name of any executive of the firm or any lawyer at a firm. The condominium also might have other purposes. But if you have records off campus, not at the corporate headquarters, not at the business where most of the activity is conducted, whether it's an investment firm or other business or a purely 100% criminal enterprise, some of which have very disciplined members. They don't discuss anything identifiable by phone. They don't do certain things, but if they have only hard copy documents, would a request is a court more willing to give a grant a search warrant for all physical records, no matter where located, if it's a, if it can be connected to the business than they are for essentially digital records that are physically observable? Has, has that argument been made in some way? I want to make sure I understand the question. I, I take it to yeah, be too asking much. about the civil versus criminal distinction primarily, or is it partly also the fact? that I think the scope of discovery, civil and criminal, and, and recognizing that civil is distinct from the Fourth Amendment, that, that there's a very broad scope for physical documents when they relate to, for example, a crime, uh, investment fraud, or some other type of fraud. And is that scope narrow if it's in digital form, in effect? Oh, I see. Um so a, a couple of thoughts. Um, one issue that has come up is whether the digitalization of documents changes the scope of what can be obtained, for example, with a subpoena. Uh, and so that in the, in the grand jury subpoena context, there would be a limit on the burdensomeness of complying with the subpoena. And one argument that gets made is, well, wait a minute, in the digital context, it's really easy to disclose a lot of documents, and therefore it's less burdensome to comply uh, uh, with, with the request. Um, that's only in the subpoena context, which will uh, often arise in the corporate crime context. Although in the, you know, I've, so I've been talking about search warrants where the government is not kind of requesting help; they're going in and they're the search uh, themselves. Um, in terms of the difference between the civil discovery rules and the kind of issues that I'm thinking about, one really important significance is that traditionally in the criminal context, especially when the government has a warrant. Uh, there's been a sense that, you know, the, the warrants are not optional. Warrants are not kind of, well, this seems to be a reasonable request. Uh, the rules, you know, for example, Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure says, if the government establishes probable cause of particularity, the court shall issue the warrant, not, not an optional call. Um, and so the idea has been that the gut, that showing required to get the search warrant justifies pretty strong medicine in terms of, you know, government really can carry out that warrant. Uh, and, and an issue that has come up is whether the civil discovery principles, especially with electronically stored information, should carry over to that digital content. So uh, a few magistrate judges in particular have said, well, we, we've got the civil discovery rules that tell us what to do with electronically stored information. And in that context, there's much more, um, uh, much a lower, kind of uh, less severe methods that are generally used Maybe it would be a search for keywords. And, and for example, one magistrate judge said, you carry out the warrant, you, know, you can do a couple searches for keywords, but that should be it. Uh, and the government says, well, what if the evidence is hidden? And the court says, well, prove to me that there's good reason to think the evidence is hidden, and I'll let you search it in a different way. Uh, and, and that's kind of a civil discovery-based concept. Uh, but imagine how that would apply in the physical world of traditional search. It'd be kind of like the judge saying, I'll, you, know, you can search 123 Main Street, Apartment 2, but you're only allowed to search the kitchen. Uh, 
Um, and so you're not allowed to search any rooms outside the kitchen, um, or you have to search the kitchen first, and only if you don't find the evidence in the kitchen can you search the hallway. Uh, that kind of management of the search process is traditionally not seen. Instead, it's, it's, as long as the government is particularly describing the place to be searched, the government can execute the warrant however, it's, however it thinks it's appropriate, with the only review being a general review for, for reasonableness. So, so at least so far, there's been a fairly strong split between the civil rules, the sense of, kind of what's appropriate in civil discovery, and the criminal investigative rules, given the government's interest in investigating. That's at least so far. Well, it's, it's an ongoing tension as to whether there should be similar approaches or different approaches. Yes? Um, I just wanted to ask, the, at this point, wouldn't it be prudent if we disabused ourselves of the notion that we have a Fourth Amendment in light of the, I would say, stuff like the National Defense Authorization Act and the USA Patriot Act? Um, hasn't that hollowed out the Fourth Amendment and left us with a Fourth Amendment basically in symbol or name only? Yeah, you know, I, I think no is, is the short answer. You know, I mean, the Fourth Amendment is alive and well. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and partly uh, uh, that reflects recent case developments. Uh, Riley, for example, is one. Uh, you know, that's an example of the court considerably expanding Fourth Amendment protections in light of technological change. Uh, or United States versus Jones from 2012. Uh, saying hey, the government uh, commit, they committed a search when they attached uh, a tracking device to a car, which uh, lower courts, most lower courts, applying earlier cases, had said was not the case. Um, you know, I, I think it's actually, although it's it, there are a lot of concerns that the Fourth Amendment's role is eroding. I don't see that, um, and I think actually cases like Riley suggest that the courts are very attentive to this question. It's remarkable and important. I think. The Riley case was unanimous. Um, very rare for a blockbuster Fourth Amendment case to be unanimous. And I don't think any of the parties expected that case to be unanimous. It's sort of understood that was going to be a 5-4 case one way or the other. And instead, a unanimous win of a full warrant protection for the defense. So um, I think actually, uh, you know, the, the Fourth Amendment is alive and well, and the courts are quite attentive to the concern that technology is eroding privacy protections or that you know, we need to make sure the role of the, of, of the Constitution uh, is maintained over time. And in cases like Riley, I think are the best examples of how the courts are, are, are really concerned about these questions. And there, there are examples of this, um, lots of examples of the lower courts, of um, lower courts essentially saying, we've got this traditional rule, the Fourth Amendment needs to do more in the techn technological world. Uh, uh, an example of this would be there's a Ninth Circuit case that deals with uh, the border search exception. The traditional rule is that when you cross an international border, your property can be searched. Well, what happens if you're carrying cell phones or laptops? And there's so much stuff, again, on a computer. Uh, and the Ninth Circuit said, we're going to introduce a special rule for computers. Uh, if the government wants to conduct a forensic search of a computer, they need suspicion, they need reasonable suspicion to stop the government from conducting sort of blanket searches of anybody who's crossing the border. And that's a, a, a very Riley-like example. It's actually the year before Riley uh, in the Ninth Circuit of the course being really attentive to this, this question of technological change and making sure that the, the concerns you have before them no longer you know, meaning much don't come to, don't come to pass. Um, so what's the effect of Riley on evidence that a detective or a police would collect and then um, not be subject to um, evidence they can use if the plain view rule is, um, if it's found in the digital realm and it's found in plain view and they can't use it. So then what then happens to that evidence? So first off, if just the police officer saw it, the detective saw it, and then versus what if the prosecutor saw it? What if other parties saw it? And then what's to stop that detective from somehow using that? Yeah, so this is a great question. For how would the plain view, the idea of ending plain view for computer search is actually work? Um, so there are different ways that the courts could implement this idea. One would be to say that any disclosure is a constitutional violation. Uh, and that would require the courts to sort of watch when information is being disclosed. So the officer who sees the information would essentially be sworn to secrecy, or at least within law enforcement, could not share that information. 
um, outside of law enforcement. It couldn't be disclosed. Uh, the disclosure would be a Fourth Amendment violation because it would have transformed the initial seizure, which was not based on the warrant, uh, into an unreasonable seizure. Um, one, a tricky question that absolutely becomes, how do you stop the government from say, say you're the officer and you see there's evidence of some crime. Well, instead of disclosing that information, you decide to walk past 123 Main Street in apartment two, just to see what might be going in through the window. Right? And it's sort of a but for cause of the evidence you saw, but it may be hard to trace. Um, and trying to figure out exactly what, what the line is that, that can be allowed um, would really be something for the, the courts to figure out. You could have a, you could have a rule where uh, the officers are allowed to begin an investigation, but not have not use what they have seen as cause. So they would be allowed to walk past 123 Main Street, and if they happen to see something, they well, they're allowed to use that. But they wouldn't be able to say, "Hey, we found this evidence before. Let's use that to get a warrant to search someone." So it's, it's a really good question as for how you might monitor that and ensure uh, that, that the no claim. Uh, and then some different ways. It, it seems to me like we, as human beings, become more and more bureaucratic. And, for example, in this, this case you gave about uh, the guy who was driving his car and with, with an expired license, who was stopping him to find a cigarette pack on the road. Well, he has a license to drive, supposedly, to prove his competence. His license expired last night, so now he's no longer competent to drive a car. But because of this criminal activity, the policeman can then search his car, find it, and go on a fishing trip and send him to prison for 20 years for some heroin cigarette pack, which he may not have even used because been his kid, you know, whatever. But it just seems like we we lose sight of what the law is supposed to be at times. And so it's like one thing leads to another. It becomes so bureaucratic, it becomes like the old Chinese system where it says, uh, you know, a wind, it takes a wind to blow a piece of paper into the courtroom and 500 oxen to pull it back out. And I guess it's just the human condition um, that, you know, we pass a seatbelt law supposedly for our protection, but then the cop says, well, I pulled you over because I didn't think you made your seatbelt off. That's when I smelled marijuana. I thought I smelled marijuana. And it's just like we just get crazier and crazier. And, and if you have such a rule like you're talking about, we, um, when you look onto the computer and you're looking for fraud for business or whatever, and then you find pictures where the guy murdered somebody and, and took pictures of it, and you can no longer use that. Well, I understand why they do have those, you know, the search and seizure rules where even if it's murder, it sometimes it becomes so um, necessary to make the Rule evidence to, to the cops that you can't go here. But it's like we lose common sense after that. I don't know anything about like that. No, no I, um, so I think uh, your concerns are uh, not only legitimate but shared by a lot of people, uh, including uh, in some cases a majority of the Supreme Court. Um, so uh, one example, I should have added this is another example of the earlier question of the Supreme Court expanding Fourth Amendment rights was a 2009 case called Arizona versus Gantt, which was based uh, on almost identical, the, the same concern that you raised, that you end up with these sort of bureaucratic rules that end up having these functions that are kind of way off of what they were supposed to be. There had been a, a 1981 case called New York versus Belt, which said that when somebody is, a, a driver is arrested, not only can their person be searched, that's what Robinson said, uh, but their, their car can be searched, the passenger compartment of the car can be searched. And it was another bright line case citing Robinson where they said, we just need a simple rule, anybody who's a driver uh, or a recent driver of the car, a recent occupant of the car, the car can be searched in the passenger compartment to find, again, evidence of the crime, maybe a gun. Uh, and in Arizona versus Gantt in 2009, the Supreme Court overturned development. It says, no, that just goes way too far. That's unhinged from the traditional justifications of the search incident to arrest exception of protecting officer safety because the officer is not going to um, leave the person who's being arrested near the entrance of the car if the officer has a genuine fear that there's a gun in the car. What's the officer going to do? They're going to put him in the squad car. And in fact, the routine was 
arrest the person, put them in the squad car, go back and search the car. Um, and the court said that you, you can't do that. We're not going to extend the law that, that far. And so they introduced a more restrictive rule to limit the searches to avoid that incentive. So, so sometimes common sense prevails. Uh, it may take a long time. Uh, and it's always tricky at the Supreme Court because typically they're looking for lower court disagreement. And sometimes you'll have a lower court decision that is wrong but really clear. And then it takes something that gets the justices interested in it. Maybe sometimes the lower court intentionally misinterpreting the rule in order to prompt Supreme Court review. But then eventually, you know, in, in a few cases we've seen in the last five, six years, uh, the court is reversing course uh, and, and recognizing having that same reaction to prior cases. Here, we've got some kind of dependent on the idea that um, the search of, say, a hard drive could involve, you know, searching every single document on the I understand you address that. Um, the court can't say you can only search a certain way. What if the government chose to search using a keyword, say, tax, and they came across a document that said, you know, with all the money I saved on my tax evasion, I now opened a crystal meth lab, and here's the address. <laughs> right. Um, why? You know, that's not a search where they're reasonably looking at absolutely everything. They were trying to look just for the, with what um, they're supposed to be looking for. Why can that be a, what was the, the uh, Thank you. Thank you. Why can't that be a plain view exception for the individual? Yeah, so I think you could have, you sort of imagine two sets of rules. One would be the government has to conduct a narrow search, but they get the benefit of the plain view exception. Or the government can conduct a broad search, but no plain view. Uh, and I think you could have either one of those um, uh, will, will be plausible. The problem with the first approach, as I see it, is coming up with what that narrow search is is actually really hard. Uh, and the government is always going to have, a, to my mind, a pretty good argument. Like, OK, the narrow search didn't work. Let's do the more invasive search this time. The court's going to say, OK, now you can do the more invasive search. Um, and it's always going to be possible that the evidence is still there. They just haven't found it with the narrow search. So in order to avoid kind of a cat and mouse game where a person committing a crime can say, well, this is cool. All you have to do is make sure you hide your evidence in a way that they're not going to get it under the keyword search. Um, and, and you can commit any crime you want. The government, I think, has a legitimate right under the warrant to conduct the invasive search for the evidence described in the warrant. So I think you're right. You could have re retain the narrow search and allow plain view. But it means um, not allowing the government to get the evidence that the, it should be allowed to get under the warrant itself. If the government's allowed to do whatever they want, but then they make a choice, and on a case by case basis, they still have the choice in the name to decide whether they can Yeah, you could have that kind of case by case uh, rule. It'd just be tricky because it would vary judge to judge. You could have, you know, what's reasonable, you could have appellate judges disagreeing on individual keyword searches. This has been a, a, an issue that has come up. Some judges have a those restrictions on search warrants, where they'll say to try to limit the search for exactly these reasons, they'll say, okay, you have to start off with a keyword search. And here are the allowed keywords. And then the government will say, well, we tried those keywords and they didn't work, so we want to search more. And the judge will say, well, I don't know if it's reasonable to search more. So here are the scenarios where there could be, you know, they could have changed the keyword. They could, instead of saying tax, they said something else, and just, uh, you know, using a simple code. Um, and the judge was saying, ah, maybe that's okay. Well, how is a magistrate judge supposed to know what's a reasonable way of executing a warrant? What's a reasonable keyword? Um, and you'll, you'll never know what's there unless the invasive search is conducted. So I, I tend to think that the, the better approach is just to have a, a broad rule allowing the government to search for what's within the warrant and then limits on what's outside. Yes. Um, my question sort of builds off of a previous one, but uh, do you believe that digital surveillance programs like PRISM are a violation of Fourth Amendment rights? Or is it reasonable under a claim of danger? Yeah, so, um, so it depends on which program. Uh, there are a bunch of different programs, and some of them we don't know a whole lot about how they work. Um, the, the one that raised the most concern from a privacy standpoint, maybe not a Fourth Amendment standpoint, but from a privacy standpoint, was the Section 215 metadata program, uh, which is really the, the blockbuster uh, revelation of all of the Snowden disclosures. Um, and it was the first one out of the gate 
that the government was collecting uh, basically phone records, not the contents of communications, but metadata on, on sort of an everyone scale, so millions and millions of people's uh, metadata uh, all collected. Um, I, I think that was constitutional. Uh, I think it's constitutional under current law, and that it, that's because of the distinction, to my mind, between content and metadata. Um, that's how I would in interpret it, um, but there are certainly good arguments that that rule should be changed. Exactly how to change it is sort of where, where the, the difficult questions uh, arise. In terms of the other programs that uh, PRISM and a lot, of, a lot of different programs, one thing to keep in mind is that some of these involve collection outside the United States or people who don't have Fourth Amendment rights or outside the United States. Uh, courts so far have recognized special national security rules or a rule of reasonableness rather than a warrant requirement. So, um, you know, I, I would say that what, what the government has done, as you might imagine for a government that hires a lot of lawyers, is have programs that um, satisfy the existing set of Fourth Amendment rules. To my mind, the, the really interesting question comes up, should you have different constitutional rules? Um, and there's just a lot up for grabs. There's a lot of the big national security surveillance programs are dealing with the latest in technological facts um, in the kind of scenarios where there's just very few cases involving national security type searches where there's just very little case law about what the standard should be. So um, where the law should go there is like it is an incredibly important question. Uh, and, and, and so I wouldn't be at all surprised if we see changes in the direction of Fourth Amendment law to respond to those concerns, even though, to my mind, the programs at least these days, is it, you know, we've seen them on paper uh, for the Constitution. Right, thanks. Last question. Last question. Uh, um, do you, have you talked to Peter Thiel about your book at all? No. Oh, okay. That was my you mean Justice Thiel? No, Peter Thiel, the um, uh, venture capitalist, PayPal founder that's a huge Fourth Amendment privacy. I'm toying with you because there, there was a recent story oh. uh, that Thiel is saying that Donald Trump is going to name him Phil Justice. Oh, I, I didn't Maybe get that's that joke. for my book, I should say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, he is he is quite vociferous in his privacy stance. So, if if, if he has made a justice, it will be it will be very interesting justice to watch. Um, but no, I'm not. I'm not.